Um, thank you so much and welcome everybody to our um, all California chapter chat on climate change, child health and the role of the pediatrician. Um, I'm Naomi Bardak. I'm a professor of pediatrics at UCSF and I see clinic, um, I see patients clinically at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, which is the county hospital in San Francisco. Um, I'm a co-chair of the California Chapter 1 Climate Change and Child Health Committee, um, and I just want to welcome everybody. It's it's really an exciting um, event tonight because it's because it's all of California. It's California Chapter 1, Chapter 2, um, Chapter 3, and then also um, the Orange County Chapter, and you'll hear from each one of us um, at the beginning of the, of the meeting tonight. I want to give a really special thank you to Yolanda Ruiz, who is executive director of the AP California Chapter One, and Sana Saeed, the project assistant for um, California Chapter One as well. And then this chat is particularly relevant today in recognition of Earth Day, which was on Saturday. Um, and also there's a new report that just came out from the EPA on Monday um, called Climate Change and Children's Health and Well-Being in the United States. Um, so we are really so glad that you've decided to join us tonight. Next slide, please. Um, and we want to start the night with a land acknowledgement um, and just acknowledge that our chapter territory spans from the northern border of California to the southern border of Monterey, Kings, Tulare, and the Inyo counties. This land was once the home for Native Americans from over 40 different tribes. Native Americans from these territories still live in California and have strong, vibrant communities and cultures, and we want to acknowledge those tribes and respect the history of the land that we now inhabit, particularly in relationship to climate change and how much they're stewards of the earth. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go over the agenda for tonight. We're doing our welcome, um, and then we're going to have uh, the AP California Climate Change and Child Health chapters. Each one will just do a very brief presentation so people know what each chapter is up to and how to join if you're interested and you haven't yet joined your um, uh, the Climate Change Committee for your chapter. Uh, then we're going to talk briefly about a framework for climate change and child health advocacy in California, because I think it's helpful as we think about how to make change to think about the framework for how to do that. Um, and then we have an amazing group of speakers. Um, Gail Lee is sustainability director of UCSF and will do more formal introductions in a minute. Um, Karina Marr is a pediatrician and medical educator. And Lisa Patel is the executive director of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. Um, so we'll be hearing from each one of them and we'll do some questions and answers. Uh, after as part of that. And then um, we're going to close with a note to your future climate self, which you will hear more about um, when we get there. Uh, and I think that's my, the summary of our agenda. So now I'm going to hand over to um, Sonia to introduce herself and tell, tell us more about California Chapter One. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sonia Swenson. I'm a third year resident in pediatrics at UCSF in San Francisco. Um, and I'm one of the co-chairs along with Naomi and Amanda um, of the California Chapter One uh, Committee on Climate Change and Child Health. Um, and to kind of give a brief update or summary of what we've been up to lately, um, we've been working um, on launching a needs assessment to understand whether climate change conversations are have reached clinical settings in our area. And our goals are sort of threefold, um, understanding if pediatricians are talking to patients and families about climate change, if so, how we can better support them in these conversations and also developing some posters and discussion guides and um, community groups to share experiences and best practices um, around having these conversations as a pediatrician. So currently we've been gathering survey responses from members within our chapter and even expanding it beyond our chapter at this point. And we're also working to develop some posters and materials to be displayed in clinical settings to start conversations about climate change and health. Um, so those were a couple examples of the posters and then, um, in the lower right-hand corner of that previous slide, actually, sorry, Yolanda, um, is um, just to also note that last month in March, we partnered with the Legislative Advocacy Committee on a chapter chat um, with their group and led a breakout room on Senate Bill 1137, a state law requiring that oil well drilling be kept at a distance from places where people live, work, and go to school. Um, and so we are trying to expand those types of partnerships within our chapter as well. Um, and you can go to next slide, please. 
Um, and if you are interested in taking our survey, we would love to have your responses. It's a short survey, just takes a few minutes um, and feel free to do it uh, at a point when, when you have time, but this is the link that we can also um, put in the, in the chat or, and send out later. Thank you. Great, and now um, California chapter two. I yeah, hi, um, I'm talking on behalf of my partners in crime. <laughs> I would say uh, Karina, Trisha, um, Cindy, and um, Tomas is on our executive director. And we've been um, trying to engage in different activities over the course of the past few months. Um, I would say a big role, a big piece is education. So a couple of um, events that we've um, we've tried to arrange through uh, partnerships, like with with um, the institutions we work at, or uh, with the uh, chapter itself, chapter folks itself. So uh, the UCLA Preventive Medicine um, uh, program uh, hosted. Um, environmental health sessions, which were open to all members um, of the, uh, all pediatricians in the community, uh, along with the P Western States PSU up at, at San, San Francisco. And then we had, um, we have a symposium speakers scheduled um, for climate, uh, climate change specific speaker, uh, going to speak on healthy air for healthy kids. Um, the Projects currently listed in this are uh, chronal in chronological order, but I just wanted to mention like the educational pieces that we are working on. And then um, a more community-based event that we participated in was uh, more recently um, on Saturday at a community park where we distributed um, uh, seeds to community uh, kids and families um, and spread the um, word uh, of Earth Day. And then we've tried to engage more members through engaging in our, our chapter socials and um, also trying to have a greater presence at our um, chapter two symposium. Uh, and then uh, in the realm of advocacy, we've tried and uh, gotten uh, to know uh, some local, uh, I guess, local stewards in the field and try and get uh, meetings with them and try and align agendas with them. So uh, one of them is the uh, Los Angeles County Chief Health and Climate Officer. Um, more of the activities are obviously going to be slated for the summertime. And then um, the uh, climate coffee with uh, the climate center, uh, the uh, CEO of the climate center, which is scheduled to occur in May. So as you can see, a smattering of different activities that we are Thank you. Oh, sorry. And uh, uh, if you want to join us, uh, there'll be information uh, that's in the chat and also um, a, a, a slide that will be shown by one of our members, Ian Karina. Awesome. Thank you so much. Chapter three. <clears throat> Hi, I don't think uh, Dr. Nguyen's on. Uh, my name is Meredith Kennedy. I'm the executive director from California Chapter 3, which is San Diego and Imperial Counties. And um, just to give an overview of things that have just been and are upcoming, um, our committee is quite active. Vine Nguyen and Sally Kaufman are pediatricians in San Diego. Um, <clears throat> Vi works at Kaiser. And Sally, I think, was working at Kaiser, but I'm not sure where she is now. Um, but they are planning a big um, summit on Saturday, August 12th, that will be in person, I think likely at UCSD, um, but I will be sure all the chapters get the information if you're interested in coming, but it's gonna be a heat and human health summit. We just, um, the other day had a presentation, a webinar on building electrification. That was really great and it's available um, to watch. I can post that link in the chat box in a minute. Um, our committee is quite uh, busy. They have so many partnerships. I told Dr. Nguyen I needed a org chart to keep track of all of her partnerships she has. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you, Yolanda. Um, so 
we have a climate change and health committee and also there's the San Diego Pediatricians for Clean Air. They kind of work simultaneously and together in a partnership. Um, one of the things they did last year was a climate ride and a rally for their lives um, last summer. And it's a picture of uh, all the participants on their bikes. Um, we have resources on our chapter website at the link that you can see on the slide. And if anyone's interested and lives in San Diego or Imperial County, um, you can email Dr. V. Nguyen at her email is on the slide as well um, if you're interested in joining. And I see that Dr. Spencer's on the call. I don't know if he wants to speak up about any of the advocacy work they're doing. Yeah. I, hi, this is Dan Spencer. I'm a pediatrician from San Diego and I've been involved as well. And uh, I, we, I didn't have the list of everything prepared because Meredith, you're absolutely right in that we are a very active chapter and uh, we do a lot of, uh, of advocacy against you know, try, trying to support building electrification, green, uh, uh, environment, you know, county environmental health uh, plans, trying to be very aggressive about those and also having other events that involve kids too, like our events with the Audubon Society that we did. We I Love Your Wetlands Day. And uh, we have an art project coming up uh, for kids to uh, submit and have an opportunity to display climate-focused art. Um, I don't have the list in front of me and I wish I did. Um, but um, yeah, V, uh, I'll have to text her and see if she'll be on at some point uh, to, to give the full rundown, but that's pretty much what I have off the top of my head. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing. Yeah, they do an annual um, science fair and writing competition. So it uh, covers a lot of different areas, poems, art, and it's all climate change uh, focused. So that is coming up soon. Thank you for your time. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. Orange County, you want to go ahead? I think it's Reshmi Basu is going to speak. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm on the board of the, our Orange County chapter, or chapter four. Um, unfortunately, nobody from our um, climate change committee was able to be here tonight. So, um, and it's one of our uh, newer um, committees formed in 2020. Um, so I think we're still picking up some speed. So just in general terms, um, you know, their recommendations have helped um, reduce our environmental footprint for our activities and our events, especially our um, last um, large um, annual CME event. Um, and then right now they're working on uh, resources for patients and families, as well as training resources for um, physicians. So we're hoping to pick up some speed when we they formed the committee. Um, that's when COVID was starting. So um, taking inspiration from, from the rest of you, um, we would love to have more involvement. Um, so uh, you can scan the QR codes on these slides um, to be involved with that. Thank you for your time. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to hand over to um, Sonia Swenson, who is another um, uh, um, co-chair of our committee for Chapter 1. And I wanted to give one really big shout out actually to Amanda Milstein, who is our third co-chair. There's a lot to do in climate change and child health. So we have three co-chairs for our committee. Um, and she is uh, doing an amazing job putting things into um, the chat, all these links that are going into the chat. And she is uh, potentially on call for her kids, which is why she's not doing much presenting today, but um, but I just wanted to give a shout out to her and a thank you for all the, all the amazing work she does. Um, Sonia, you want to take it away? Great. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you, Amanda, for putting in the links as I was speaking to. Um, so um, next slide, please. Um, so we just, you know, I know that we're preaching to the choir in many ways, but um, just kind of as a reminder for all of us that climate change impacts every organ system and does not impact um, people equally. Um, and the picture on the left is just to sort of highlight some of the different topics that come up when we think about climate change and health, air pollution, allergens, extreme heat, severe weather, environmental degradation, degraded living conditions and social inequities, changes in vector ecology, um, and some of the infectious diseases that go along with that, as well as impacts on our food and water supply um, and the quality of our water. And of course, the most vulnerable people are already impacted and will continue to be the most impacted. Um, the primary ways that we in California um, are experiencing the health effects of climate change so far um, are in the particularly in fires, the wildfire season, and heat. In the top right 
uh, graphs, you can see how the number, duration, and intensity of heat waves have been increasing over the last um, 50, 60 years. And then the lower right graph is um, just to give a little visual um, of how the frequency of wildfire and duration of the wildfire season has lengthened with each additional degree of global warming. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of climate change and child health, we know, again, that children, so that was kind of thinking of the different ways that climate affects our health, um, and then thinking specifically about our role as pediatricians, we know that children are disproportionately affected because they spend more time outdoors, they have more years to be exposed to the wildfire fire pollution, um, higher temperatures, and there are many different ways that we can act and pull different levers as pediatricians. On the individual level, we can make sort of these adaptations in our lifestyles um, to mitigate effects of climate change in our interpersonal relationships. Um, we can engage with our patients, our peers, our colleagues, and, net and networks. At the organizational level, in our healthcare settings, we can put pressure on our institutions um, to make changes. Um, I loved hearing the example about how the committee um, is um, making recommendations for CME events. I love that. <laughs> Um, and of course, we can also engage in advocacy at the local, state, or federal level. And today we're going to hear from three different speakers, each taking action at a different level. And what we would like you to be thinking about is which level um, you would like to maybe focus a new goal on for the next for for the next several months to come, and how you might set that intention at the end of our talk today. All right. So um, this brings us to the ex most exciting part where we get to meet our speakers for the night. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing them. So um, Gail, you can go back to the last slide. Thank you. Um, so to start off with, Gail Lee currently serves as the Director of Sustainability at UCSF, um, has been in, in that role since 2010. She has 30 years of experience in healthcare, environmental health and safety in public, nonprofit and private industri industries. Her particular interest lies in helping healthcare institutions, which are known for their 24-7 operations, energy usage, and waste generating activities, and helping them reduce their environmental impact. Um, she serves on the UCSF Advisory Committee on Sustainability and on the Advisory Committee for the Center, UC Center for Climate, Health, and Equity. Um, and she serves, she has many other hats as well. Um, and just to name a few others, she serves on the advisory committee of the new UCSF NEIHS funded Earth Center. Um, and she, I think that her um, her role as an environmental specialist um, really provides a, a strong background for being a champion of sustainability at UCSF. Um, and then moving on to um, Karina Maher. Karina, Dr. Maher is a pedi pediatrician in Los Angeles who's practiced clinically for um, multiple decades before focusing on ed medical education and specifically working on writing and editing pediatric board study materials, as well as projects to help to educate fellow physicians on the health impacts of climate change, including board testing content for the American Board of Pediatrics Maintenance of Certification. Um, we are so excited to have um, you here today. And then um, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Lisa Patel, is the Executive Director of the Medical Society Consortium on Climate on Climate and Health, and Clinical Associate Professor um, of Pediatrics at Stanford. She's a former Presidential Management Fellow for the Environmental Protection Agency, where she coordinated the US government's efforts on clean air and safe drinking water projects in South Asia in collaboration with the World Health Organization. And she received recognition with the Trudy Spesner Award for her work. She's a member of the executive committee for the AEP's Council on Environment, Health, and Climate Change and a faculty mentor for Stanford Climate and Health. Um, so please join me in welcoming our three speakers today. Um, we will start off with Gail Lee. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, let's see how I can share my screen. There we go. Thank you for, um, everyone for welcoming me and thank you especially Amanda for inviting me today. Um, you all are all well aware, and this is really why I, I decided I really wanted to focus on sustainability in higher education um, for really all, all the reasons. You know, we have, we have families, we care about our families, and we just look down the road and see how difficult it's going to be if we don't do something and we don't do something 
10 years ago, 20 years ago. So we are on a fast track right now. And I just wanted to share UCSF's um, enterprise-wide structure. We we are we have so many different groups acting on so many different areas around sustainability, but we have a whole group focusing on um, energy, applied research, the faculty engagement, education. Uh, we have a, a group that's newly formed at UC system-wide called Pathways to Fossil Free UC. And then we have our own internal um, sustainability steering committee. We have our UCSF advisory committee where we have representation across the entire campus. Uh, that's chaired by the senior vice chancellor of finance and administration, as well as the COO of the health system. We also have um, what we're calling now a fossil free governance committee. And we have input from the academic senate. They have their own sustainability committee. Uh, we have a UC system wide, I mean, I'm sorry, a UC um, SF sustainability steering committee that focuses on all of the different areas around operations. And then we have campus representation from all the schools, the School of Dentistry, Medicine, Nursing, Pharmacy. There's a um, human health and climate change student group that's very active. We have environmental health and safety, community engagement is included in our discussions, representation from the chancellor's office, uh, real estate, the campus architect, and strategic communications. In all these areas, in addition, we have two other um, groups called the Earth Center that's um, out of the um, um, program on reproductive health and the environment. And then there's also UCSF Health has their own sustainability committee. So you can see, even with this, there are branches of people under all these, uh, all these groups that are working hard. So let me just briefly cover our UC sustainable practices policy. Um, the policy currently says that we have to achieve carbon neutrality for our scopes one and two emissions by 2025. Our scope one is direct on-site emissions, natural gas that we're burning on site, our fleet that are burning fuels, the re release of refrigerants into the atmosphere and anesthesia gases. And then scope two is emissions from purchase electricity like PG&E or SF clean power um, or you know, Peninsula clean energy. Um, these are all wholesale power companies that are selling electricity. Any emissions from those we, ha we have to account for. And luckily, we have the opportunity to purchase a lot of renewable power. And so our emissions from our purchase electricity actually is very low. It's 98% clean. And then we're looking at a carbon neutrality goal for all three scopes by 2050. And when we talk about scope three, we're talking about faculty and staff student commuting and institutionally funded air travel. And we are soon to be including um, emissions from solid waste as well. And in, in addition to that, we're also focusing on reducing our um, energy usage. So being just more efficient with our um, equipment and supplies, trying to be uh, more energy star focused, more um, you know, retrofits and things like that, where we can continue to drive down our demand for electricity and energy by 2% every year. And then for the UC Health, we, are, we have additional targets around sustainability, is obtaining 100% clean electricity by 2025. We're, we're almost there. Uh, we just have to transition out of PG&E into cleaner um, wholesale power companies. Also energy performance targets for our hospitals and office buildings. Um, like I mentioned, the 2% reduction per year, we'll be um, focusing on that as well. We're asked to maintain a membership in Practice Green Health, which is the premier environmental nonprofit that focuses on greening um, the healthcare system. Uh, we are looking at target of reducing our waste, 25 pounds of total waste per adjusted patient day. And water conservation, re you know, reducing our water consumption by 36% by 2025, and we've already achieved that at 40%. And then also um, procuring 30% sustainable food. And in all these areas, there is definitely a carbon emissions connection to it. Um, and I'll be talking more about that in a little bit. One of the other things that we are working on is reducing our um, toxics exposure. And uh, we partnered with our well-being and community grant programs to reduce endocrine disrupting chemicals. And the first grant we received was to focus on our employees at UCSF. So the target was ESL pregnant employees and their partners. We saw them as a, a population that don't generally get 
information about endocrine disrupting chemicals. So we're focusing on them. Um, parents with newborns, we provide education, a starter kit that you can see on the corner with um, EDC free food containers, baby bottles, silicone nipples and wraps. Um, and then we're gonna be expanding that program more broadly to um, UCSF Health and San Francisco General. So the target there is the same, ESL pregnant patients, uh, or if they have a, a partner, and then with also if they have newborns, we'll provide the same education, the starter kit, and we will be reaching out to um, probably the OBGYN departments um, and uh, pediatrics to en engage. So our target is about 100 to 400 um, participants in that grant. So that's one of the projects we're working with. And we also work closely with the PSU. Um, we actually have funded them on certain projects and developing this pediatric environmental health toolkit is one of them. And we'll be working with, um, with them probably every time there's a project that they want to put together, uh, we try to help fund it. So um, this is what we're doing is, you know, doing recruitment internally. And the discussion really is focusing on educating people about trying to avoid BPA, BPF, BPS, um, getting away from canned food in general, getting away from plastics, plastic water bottles, Teflon, cling wrap, and you know, avoid plastics in dishwashers. One of the main things that we're trying to get across too is that the plastics, this, the proliferation of all this plastic is driving the demand for more fossil fuels. And this is something people aren't making that connection. If we eliminate plastic, there's, there will be a reduction in the demand for fossil fuel to make plastic. And in, I, you know, in some of the reading that I've um, saw recently, it, it is actually a, a strategy by the fossil fuel industry to pivot to find more market for their products. Um, and then carbon emissions from anesthesia gases. So this is something that we've been working on um, in the last couple of years, led by Seema Gandhi, an anesthesiologist in our perioperative unit. Um, she was able to eliminate desflurane, which has a very high global warming potential. It's the highest of all anesthesia gases compared to the conventional. And it is actually invented at UCSF. And even, even then, um, you know, this is something that we all felt was important. So we just completely eliminated it from the formulae. Another thing we found out was nitrous oxide, which has a global warming potential of 265, is generally brought in in these huge H tanks and they're piped in through this piping system that goes directly to the ORs or procedure rooms. And we discovered that when we looked at how much we were purchasing in a year's time versus how much was actually administered to the patient, we were losing 90% of nitrous oxide to the atmosphere. And um, for trying to find a leak in a huge distribution system was not feasible. And we decided we would decommission the entire distribution system and tra transition to cylinders of nitrous oxide. Another area that uh, Dr. Gandhi focused on was reducing the fresh gas flow of anesthesia gases to 0.7 liters per minute. Um, a lot of times um, the anesthesiologists, when they set up the cart, they turn the glass flow on and it's running well before the patient enters the room and, um, and then even after. And the fresh grass flow rate could be very high and it's clinically not necessary. So that was something that um, Dr. Gandhi has been writing about as well. Um, another thing that we've been focusing on UC system-wide is new construction. So UC Irvine is building a new hospital and an ambulatory care center they are focusing on all electric carbon-free design. Um, and not to be outdone by UC Irvine, UC San Francisco has also committed to um, an all electric carbon-free surgery center and clinic. Uh, they're calling it the Bayfront Clinic uh, at Illinois, Illinois and third. And then the plan for UC San Francisco Medical Center at Parnassus is all electric carbon-free design as well. And none of those will be getting any natural gas, all of the, um, the systems will be operating like with 100% electricity. And then as part of the, our decarbonization commitment, but, you know, I don't know if you've heard, there's been a lot of um, 
uh, concern by students that drives a lot of the changes that happen at UC. Uh, but the students have been have been really pushing for total decarbonization for all 10 campuses. And we've been um, working on the anesthesia gases as one, uh, reducing um, emissions from our refrigerants, which are uh, HFCs, gases, and we're trying to actually switch out from low emission refrigerants to zero emission refrigerants. Uh, we have looked, seeking, we're seeking funding to convert all of our fleet vehicles to all electric. I mentioned the surgery center, the new hospital. We have a research administration building that we're also building at Parnassus. And that the commitment there is that it will be all electric as well. And then for the, all the existing buildings, we're focusing on uh, building control so that lights go out and ventilation systems turn down when there's nobody in the room, nobody in the, on the floor. Switching uh, from all of the fluorescent lights to LED lighting. And the biggest um, energy demand comes from heating and cooling. So heating air, cooling air, eating water and cooling water. Uh, but the big elephant in the room really is the Parnassus power plant. That power plant at Parnassus generates enough electricity, but through the burning of natural gas to really power the entire Parnassus Heights campus. And so every time we build a new building, we don't want to build, we don't want to increase the size of the plant. We want to really wean off of it. So any new building coming on is meant to be carbon free, no natural gas, all electric. And then um, slowly we plan to transition that power plant to an all electric system. Same thing at Mission Bay campus. Um, we're focusing on an all electric uh, district and heating and cooling so that we not only focus building by building, we actually look at the entire campus as one district and we can do the heating and cooling most efficiently and then pump it out to all the buildings. So that's the strategy that uh, we're looking for there. And then other UCSF um, health led programs, we're doing energy assessments and in our ORs, which we know ORs use six times more energy than patient floors, they generate uh, 40 percent of all the waste generated at a hospital. So we're really focusing on what's happening in the OR to be more energy efficient, more you know reducing waste. And as I mentioned before, um, a lot of single use medical um, devices and equipment, you know we have isolation gowns, we have masks, we have surgical gowns. All of those are currently single use. They're made from polyurethane and um, I'm sorry, poly polyethylene, and they are all derived from fossil fuels. So by our purchase of that, the single use disposable products, we're driving that market for more fossil fuels. We're also looking at diagnostic imaging and radiation therapy equipment um, to try to influence manufacturers to build Energy Star. So we had a program here uh, funded by the Office of the President to do a MRI energy study to, so we metered um, MRIs here at UCSF and at other hospitals to see if we could identify ways to reduce the energy demand of those MRIs. At the same time, the manufacturers are making claims that their MRI is more energy efficient than the conventional, but they were not very um, open with sharing their data. So part of the MRI metering study was to to really meter the conventional versus the new MRI machines. And if um, they are found to be more efficient, we wanna share that information with UC, um, US EPA, who has been trying to do Energy Star ratings for MRIs for many years. And uh, we'll be sharing all of that data that we're collecting with them. Um, there's another study called the ASHRAE study. They deal with um, painting and cooling in hospitals. And they're actually, looking to meter not only all imaging equipment, so PET scans, CT scans, um, Linux machines, cyber knives, um, nuclear cameras, all of those um, are going to be metered by ASHRAE so that we can identify where there's opportunities for energy savings in medical equipment. And then lastly, um, partnership with the city of San Francisco to, to really try to push for an all electric ambulance system. And in our new hospital, we've already got agreement that we're going to be installing uh, charging stations in our ED parking lot so that we can charge those ambulances when, when they come in um, electric. And UCLA is looking at purchasing 
one, but I'm working with the city of San Francisco to make sure that AMR could actually transition over to it. And maybe we can use some IRA funding um, to help facilitate that. And lastly, we're working on a climate resilience workshop. We're looking at how we could be more resilient working with our community to find out what are the things that uh, climate change impact will have on our hospital um, from heat to uh, rising sea level to extreme temperatures, atmospheric rivers, wildfire and smoke, um, and energy and power outages, rolling blackouts, that kind of thing. So we're, we're looking at what that impact will have on us at UCSF and how that impacts our staff and our vulnerable population within our campus as well as the community. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take those later. So our next speaker is Karina Marr. Uh, Karina, if you uh, want to take over and I think looks like. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, super interesting, Gail. Thank you for all the work you do. Um, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming and for participating. And thank you for having me. I am Karina Mayer or Maher or Mar, also fine. Every how everyone else pronounced it. Uh, what, I'm one of the co-chairs of the Chapter Two Climate Change Committee. I'm here in Los Angeles, and I have a potpourri type presentation in that I'd like to speak about three ways we as pediatricians can have a role in patient care as it relates to climate change. The first might be surprising to some of you, whereas some others of you may have already put it into practice, and that is voting. So, uh, next slide. Voting is a social determinant of health and a climate change solution. So last year, the AAP led a nonpartisan get out the vote campaign called Vote Kids. And last June, the American Medical Association formally recognized voting as a social determinant of health. And many of us meet with local and state legislators hoping to influence them to write and vote for policies that will curb climate change and prevent further worsening. And front and center, of course, is preserving and improving our patients' health. And we all know about primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. So think of voting as akin to primary prevention. People who vote can choose leaders and policies that will improve their health and tackle climate change. Basically, rather than trying to convince people already in power to create the change you want, vote for the right people in the first place. And studies show that people who vote are healthier. Next slide. There have been efforts already underway for the past several years, such as through programs called um, GoTV, which stands for Get Out the Vote and Vote ER that aim to encourage and make it easy for patients to register to vote right in the emergency department, the office, or other patient setting. And voter registration is incorporated into patient check-in or discharge and can be brought up during clinical care. It's a way for patients to be empowered to manage their or their child's uncontrolled asthma, for instance, by voting for clean air policies and legislators who work towards those policies or for someone living in an underserved area to get relief from the heat by voting for policies and leaders who are proactive in promoting urban landscaping or clean energy infrastructure or setting up cooling centers. And during our visits, we all ask about smoking, drinking, car seats. These are social determinants, determinants of health, just as voting is. And remember that climate change will have a huge impact on the rest of our patients' lives. So encouraging voter registration and voting is super powerful preventive care that we can provide. The AAP partnered with Vote ER, so you don't have to feel like you're going rogue or anything like that. It's encouraged to bring it up when, when appropriate. Um, so voting is a health solution, a health equity solution. Oh yeah, not yet, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and a climate change solution. So instead of us feeling helpless when a patient comes in again and again with out of control asthma or climate anxiety or heat exhaustion, we can offer the patient a concrete way to improve their health, the majority of which we know is determined by social and environmental factors. So this slide's a sort of a summary of this concept. 
So no matter what we like to think, the individual care we provide to patients is really no match for the growing harm and suffering that environmental degradation and the climate crisis are causing. Our trusted voices can help patients understand that the environment we live in is a major determinant of our health, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the climate we live in. Laws and policies determine the condition of our environment and the people we elect determine those policies. So it follows that people who vote influence their health outcomes. And we, the healthcare community, have a unique connection with our patients and families, many of whom are most harmed by fossil fuel pollution and the climate crisis and are least likely to be civically engaged. So it's imperative that patients recognize that they have the power and how to use it. So next slide. So I hope I have convinced you if you weren't already that voting is a climate and health solution and civic engagement belongs in healthcare. I'm gonna to move to another way that we as pediatricians can have a role in patient care as it relates to climate change. But if anyone would like more information about the role of voting, how to incorporate it, you can contact me or or put something in the chat. And there's also gonna be resource information on our last slide. So next uh, slide. Uh, so next I'm gonna mention some ways that you may educate yourself further on the health effects climate change is having on our children. Uh, and that's by taking some ABP, American Board of Pediatrics modules when it's time for your maintenance of certification activities. I don't know who sparked the idea, maybe Lisa Patel had the idea, I think. But under the guiding hand of Lori Byron, the AAP Climate Advocates Wizard, who keeps us all together, a group of us created the first ever board maintenance of certification content on climate change and health. Uh, next slide. And this is what it looks like on the ABP site. And no other specialty offers this. And we have had this opportunity since 2021. It's an MOC part two module, meaning that the test taker reviews the articles that are referenced and then answers 20 multiple choice questions. So Lisa and I wrote the Q&As based on seminal papers, including the AAP policy statement and technical report on global climate change and children's health. And other specialties are looking to us in pediatrics to emulate what we've created for their board recertification. So that's super encouraging. Next slide. And then another group of us created an MOC part four module that the AAP recently approved just like a week or two ago, um, and that will be available soon. It's what's called a practice improvement module and will be based on an interactive user-friendly graphical platform. I'm not sure there's other um, MOC modules like it, that at least that I've seen. So this course is broken up into two parts. Uh, next slide. So the first half is a what to know about the health effects of climate change portion. So it sort of goes through the basics um, and the most important evidence. And then next slide, the second half is how to best communicate with your patients and their families portion. Um, so for people who aren't used to connecting what they already do in the office or the hospital with climate change, um, this helps helps us to learn how to do that. Um, and each comes with really fun graphics and test your knowledge games. And so look for the announcement for this MOC part four module soon. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to bring up a third way for pediatricians to play a role in climate and child health. And that's through what's called Climate RX. Uh, many of you are probably already aware of Eco America's Climate RX badge. Um, but maybe have not started spreading the word amongst your colleagues. It's a badge we can order and then wear that has a scannable QR code, which brings one to all sorts of educational materials on how climate change may be affecting a patient's health. So it's a resource when you want to give patient-friendly information. Instead of a handout or printout, the patient can stand, scan and read on their device. And I would say that Pretty much every talk any of us have given on the health effects of climate change, one of the most common questions everybody has is, do you have handouts? Do you have information that I can give my patients? And here it is. So there's also a short training for healthcare providers just to get you more comfortable 
with the concepts. And then um, if you're interested, Eco America offers a longer climate health ambassador on-demand training. That's really good. Uh, next slide. So that's it. Here are links to some of what I mentioned, as well as chapter two's climate change committee members contact info. And we'll, I know we're going to share all the slides. So I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions after, please feel free to reach out to me or Priyanka or any of the chapter two members. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Karina. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, we will move on to our last speaker of the night, which is Lisa Patel, and then we'll have some good time for question and answers. Okay. So um, I think at the very beginning, we did talk a little bit about, um, you know, what the health risks and the health hazards are of climate change. And so I, I, I sort of have three messages that I want to relate to this group. One that, yes, it's bad. It's us, but there is hope. And so in terms of the bad, um, we are seeing unprecedented flooding in places like Pakistan, where a third of the country was underwater. Um, we can expect that many island nations will disappear in, in our lifetime and, and very likely in our children's lifetime. Um, there are places like Madagascar, this picture over to the left of the very dry land, uh, where people, about 1 million people on the brink of starvation from severe drought. Uh, here in the Bay Area, we experienced that heat dome last September. Um, what the temperature projection, what it's looking like is that we are coming out of three years of La Nina, which kept things a little cooler, and we're heading into an El Nino cycle, which means that we can expect uh, even hotter um, uh, uh, days and, and heat waves than we've experienced in the last five years, and so that that is upcoming. And then, of course, devastating wildfires. Wildfires have always been a part of California's natural history, but the intensity and the duration and the frequency are getting worse because of climate change. It's us. So um, I've been working in the field of climate change and studying it for 20 years. And 20 years ago, we were talking about the polar bears and it felt like it was something that was distant. But we understand today that climate change will be the greatest determinant of health for a child born today. Um, and so this is profoundly an issue of human health. And this is an important thing for us to center in because it is a very powerful message to get people engaged on this topic is to say it isn't something for a distant species in a faraway place, this is actually an issue that is affecting us today, here and now. And the other part of us that I think we should be grounding this in, in is the injustice of how much we as a country have emitted and continue to emit. And that's what this, this uh, map here is on the left, is per capita, how much more the United States consumes and how much more the United States emits uh, compared to other countries. And many of these under, other countries that were not historically responsible for emissions are the very countries that will be the hardest hit uh, by, by climate change. But there's hope. Um, so most people don't actually know that three major pieces of legislation have been passed by the Biden administration that have been the most significant pieces of um, legislation and investment in climate change that we have ever made. The Inflation Reduction Act, so named because it was a midterm year, was actually a $360 billion climate and health bill that helps us very quickly move away from fossil fuels and towards a, a renewable energy economy. Now, there are still things within that bill, and there is still a, many fights to be had with the Biden administration to ensure that we don't continue building out fossil fuel infrastructure. But what this graph is basically showing us is that with the um, Inflation Reduction Act, we are very close, uh, not within spitting distance, but within shouting distance of our goals. And we can get the rest of the way there with additional rules that the EPA is considering right now. So there is reason to be hope, um, reason to have hope. We have people in power right now that understand that this is a crisis and, and are acting that way as well in terms of the policy that they're passing. But there is still work for all of us to do. So whenever I think about climate change, I think many of us feel like this is this big, overwhelming problem, and, and we don't know where to begin. We're seeing all the bad news about the floods and the fires and the heat. Um, and, and so what, what we really try from, for a lot of us that work in climate advocacy is um, not to think about all the problems, really look at this as an opportunity. Yes, climate change is our greatest health threat, but it is also our greatest opportunity to build the world and the image that, that we should be living in. So um, the world that we live in right now is a world where we rely upon polluting, dirty fossil fuels that make things unsightly, polluted, isolating, harmful, and equitable. The solutions that we're talking about in terms of climate change creates a world that is beautiful, clean, connected, healthy, and just. 
So I'm going to talk about, and, and there's, there's no science to how I've assigned these muscles um, here. This is just my impression, and I welcome debate over what I've attached my muscles to. <laughs> but um, what, what I, I have sort of five actions that each of us as pediatricians can take and, you know, what the effort is and what the impact is. And so these top two have been covered both by Gail and by Karina. Uh, voting, I would say, as, as Karina has mentioned, climate change is a systemic problem that needs systemic solutions. And voting is a very important way to really leverage those systemic solutions. For, for effort, it has a very big impact. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Um, at, I would say sustainable healthcare, having done it within my system, that was a little bit less amenable, uh, was, was a little bit more in terms of muscle, but it's also potentially very high impact, particularly if you look at a center or work at a center that other people are looking to to be leaders in the space. Um, I'm really going to talk about the, the, these bottom three that haven't been, um, uh, these bottom two that haven't been covered, because Karina talked about counsel your patients as well. Uh, but finding your people, and I would I would put like an infinity on the number of muscles because um, it is really finding a dedicated group of people, whether it is at your school, your church, other physicians, but finding those people that you connect with on an issue and working together is really the most powerful way to make change. And I'll give you an example of that. And then very last, you see that I put decreasing your own carbon footprint doesn't require much effort and honestly doesn't have that much impact. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Unless you talk to others about it, then you get an extra muscle for that. Um, so I mentioned this, but I mentioned before that the health message when we talk about climate change is very resonant. And we as health messengers are very resonant messengers. So we are like the, the, the super uh, weapon in terms of messaging on climate change because we are trusted by the public and talking about climate change as a health issue cuts through bipartisan noise to really get to people's hearts um, and build their public consciousness and public awareness to take action on climate change. So you can see nurses, doctors, pharmacists are the top three out of four in terms of trusted voices to the public. And we know as pediatricians, right, we are constantly dealing with misinformation. We are constantly dealing with uh, social media and the things that our patients are hearing. And so we have a we have a really important opportunity to cut through the noise and talk to our patients because we are trusted by them. Um, just very briefly, I just wanted to highlight this additional resource in terms of talking to counsel and your patients about climate change. I really, I'm, I'm a hospitalist, so I have the benefit of spending as much time with my patients as I want to, uh, but I appreciate for my outpatient colleagues that you have, you know, the 15 minutes to cover the 20 issues that your patients has come to you with. Uh, my colleague, um, uh, Becca Phillips-Born, who Karina works with on the MS3-4 module, put together this really great paper um, about climate-informed pediatric care, and I just wanted to shout it out because um, what, what she, the, the frame that she creates is that you don't have to ask an additional question. Um, we can find ways to apply a climate lens to the questions that we are already asking in our um, outpatient visits for purposes of efficiency, um, but also to get to, to this issue that we know many of our patients care about. And we know that actually from, the, from polling data. Um, and then I'll tell you the, 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 you know, the number five in terms of set the example and tell others about it. Um, so I said that this is maybe the least impact thing that you can do. The fossil fuel companies have been very, very effective in making us think that uh, if I eat meat, if I drive a gas powered car, I shouldn't be saying anything about uh, fossil fuels. So that, that's a load of crap. Um, none of us, we're, all of us are imperfect. None of us lives a perfect carbon free put footprint. And that is because the fossil fuel industry has made it close to impossible for any of us to live an existence like that. So you can drive a gas powered car, you can eat meat, and you can still be a climate advocate. If you do choose to take some individual action, what's so much more important than taking that action is to tell others that you're doing it. Um, we have a lot of data to show that while many of us are concerned about climate change, our perception is that others are not concerned. And I think a big part of that is that we don't talk enough about this issue and we don't share with others what our concern is and what we're doing about it. So if you're gonna take that action, great, uh, but make a commitment to talk to your colleagues, to your family, or to someone else about the fact that you're doing it and why you're doing it. So the most powerful thing, the one that I wanna assign like infinite number of muscles to is to join a group. Um, so you're here, you're part of AP California, um, so hopefully, if you're not a part of one of the, the um, committees on climate change through AP California, you can join. But there are many other places where you can find community um, in terms of working on issues that really that you're really passionate about. 
Uh, for me, two or three years ago when the pandemic started, I started getting involved in how we could reopen our schools safely. Uh, my daughter is in San Francisco Unified School District, and we had good data to show that um, we, could, we could enact mitigation measures to get kids in school much sooner than they ended up getting into school. Well, because I have a background in environmental science, I was the person that was asked to talk about ventilation. Um, and what I discovered in the process was I would tell schools to open their windows and they would say, My, our windows are painted shut because we live in an over-policed neighborhood. Um, or we would talk to them about upgrading their HVAC systems. They would say, what HVAC system? They didn't have HVAC systems because many schools in California haven't needed them traditionally. They were built for a Mediterranean climate. Uh, well, so what started as one little question actually quickly snowballed to this very big report. Um, I, we started to write a report really focused on indoor air quality and HVAC systems, and I started reaching out to partners throughout the state um, to see who else was working on this issue, and I very quickly found that talking about climate change and health in schools uh, resulted in this very big, vibrant coalition of individuals uh, who, were, who were all working on the same issue. So um, this, there's an organization called Endomted K-12 that was working on schools and infrastructure, and we wrote an op-ed together. And we wrote this report that was just released on how um, a call to action climate resilient California schools that engaged a wide variety of partners in environmental education, teachers unions, labor unions, um, and educators as well. And, and the basic premise of the report is that our schools are poorly prepared for how quickly the climate is changing and warming. And we focus on a few health harms in particular. We talk about heat um, and the fact that uh, a lot of our schools, for example, have um, a lot of asphalt that can get very hot and very dangerous. Uh, there's a, a lot of initiatives and in understanding that green schoolyards are not only good uh, in terms of cooling, but also good for kids' mental health and for their socio um, development as well. Um, but the other you know, very fundamental issue is that if schools don't have access to air conditioning, they're going to have to close. Uh, we saw this happen during the heat dome event. Schools in Nevada had to be released by around 11 o'clock or noon because the temperatures got so high, it was too dangerous for those kids to be in that school. And so if we don't prepare our schools to be able to handle those hot days, kids that are already so far behind from the pandemic are going to fall even further behind from the school days. Um, air pollution, so wildfire smoke, is about 10 times as toxic as our estimate compared to regular air pollution and what used to be um, you know, a, an exposure of every few days, every few years is now more or less year round and more or less yearly. And the data that we have from wildfire smoke um, scares me, scares me as a mom of two young children. My, my son is five and three out of five years of his life. And those first five years are a period of very rapid lung development. Uh, he's been exposed to wildfire smoke. And we know from the adult literature that while chronic wildfire smoke exposure in firefighters, for example, leads to a host of, of risk down the line cardiovascular disease, certain types of cancer, for example. With climate change, we can expect a 50% increase in levels of smoke and children's hospitalizations as well. And again, our schools are not prepared. Um, we estimate about a quarter of the schools in California don't have HVAC systems and likely more uh, don't have ones that are up to date. And then finally, uh, the report talks about kids' mental health. Um, we cannot talk about children today without talking about the mental health emergency that children are suffering. Um, and there's good data to show that climate change really exacerbates that mental health crisis. This is a study of 10,000 youth uh, who found that um, the future is frightening because of climate change and 50% reported experiencing climate anxiety to a degree that affected their daily lives. Um, and then finally, of course, law school days uh, was, was one of the, the, the big arguments to the report was um, talking about how if we don't prepare our schools for climate resilience, um, they're going to lose more and more school days that will um, make these gaps that we're already seeing in terms of standardized testing scores between Black and Hispanic students and white students even worse. So uh, what the report really advocates for, back to the Inflation Reduction Act that I talked about at the beginning, there are billions of federal dollars that are available right now that the states can draw down to actually improve climate resilience. So this report specifically looks at schools, but um, in my work at the Medical Society Consortium, we are also working with FQHCs and community clinics to draw down those federal dollars as well to improve cl um, climate resilience there as well. And this is where it's so important for us as pediatricians to really leverage our voice. 
um, with, with our schools, with our clinics, there are places that are potentially hubs of community climate resilience where we have the opportunity to talk to our administrators, talk to our school boards and say, the money is there. Um, we need to have a plan and, and here's, here, here are the funds that are available for us to actually act upon it. And that's what this plan essentially advocates for. It says that the state of California needs to invest some money to help our districts draw down these funds. Otherwise, we're going to lose a really big opportunity to prepare our schools for the future. Um, this is just some information about the coalition. If schools is something that speaks to you, I invite you to join us. Um, Climate Health Now, which is an organization that Amanda um, has co-founded, is going to be taking up this issue as well. And we are currently uh, talking to Carmi Ferguson at AAP California to see if we can turn this into an advocacy ask for us for the Resident Advocacy Day that's happening in May in Sacramento. Um, and that is the end of that presentation and I'll, I'll take any questions. We're going to do questions um, for all the different speakers right now. Um, so maybe we'll just start. And I know people might be generating more questions for Lisa. I know I have a, a bunch of questions for everybody, um, but I'll just start with um, uh, some of the questions that had come up earlier. So for Gail, um, a couple questions. One question was asking a little bit about scope three and the, the goal for carbon neutrality for scope three. Um, and the choice of the date at, of 2050. And um, if you could speak a little bit to that, uh, that'd be great. And if you could remind all of us um, what scope three is since um, it went by on your slides, but I didn't retain it. Sure, so scope three is really uh, not emissions directly related to our operations, but indirectly related to our supply chain, uh, what our employees do. Um, so business travel is one, uh, employee commute is another. So we know that the city of California is pushing toward all electric uh, vehicle sales by 2035. So we're kind of estimating what that transition would be for our, our own population and then kind of estimating how that would drive down our commute. But we can certainly help with providing resources for um, um, not necessarily subsidized, but we can we can make arrangements with some manufacturers to provide more energy efficient vehicles at a discount price if we help provide the marketing and um, information to our own own employees. So that's one thing we, we can certainly try to incentivize people to do that. Maybe even incentivize them to use alternative transportation. And we just set up a um, an agreement by the students that they actually voted to have themselves um, take money from their registration that would go toward a, um, a commuter pass every month, $26 a month, and that we just give them a commuter pass and that will you know, get them out of their cars. So that's another area. Supply chain is the most difficult part of scope three that's related to the, the materials that we buy. So do we buy materials and food uh, locally grown or shipped in from Chile? you know, flowers and fruits of, that are out of season. So that's one way we can drive down um, what we use in the hospital and what we incentivize people to do. Waste is another one. So if we can get people to compost more, then less waste goes into landfill. And then the methane gas that's generated in the landfill will be reduced. And compost actually helps sequester carbon. So the more we compost, the more we can pull carbon out of the atmosphere. So those are some ways we can incentivize reduction from um, emissions from our activities for that specific scope three. But we realize that it's gonna take a long time, mainly because the biggest factor of it is supply chain. And the only way to really address emissions from supply chain is to push the manufacturers to, to um, change their behavior um, in their process of making the materials and reduce it. But the more that we do to get away from single-use disposables and plastics and using more durable, reusable goods that will actually drive down emissions from our supply chain as well. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, very thorough. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I messed up one thing. Before we do more questions and answers, we actually thought it'd be helpful to get a sense in the room, um, in the Zoom room, uh, because there's many of us on the screen, that we would use a very brief um, Zoom poll to get a sense of sort of where people are 
uh, thinking right now in terms of there's, we just talked a lot about a lot of different options of how to do climate action as a pediatrician. Um, and so we thought we'd get a little bit of feedback um, from the group. So I just posted um, a, a poll and everybody can just take a minute or two to answer it and then we'll share the results. Um, so we got to read of the room. We have about 25%. Um, so we had 20 of 22 people participating and about 20% of people, 25% of people said that they would, um, that in the next six months, they might consider counseling patients on ways to protect their health against climate impacts. Um, about 5%, uh, just one person said they might counsel patients about how to get involved in community climate advocacy. Uh, about 20% said they would work on making their clinical practice setting uh, energy efficient and low waste. And then about 45%, um, the most common um, was people saying that they would engage with policymakers at the local, state, or national levels to promote climate action. Um, so that's, I think, very helpful. I think part of the goal here is to support all of us in, in doing um, these kinds of actions. So uh, I'm going to click back. And then um, uh, let's see. Um, so I'm going to just go to our next questions also. Um, uh, one question I think for Gail was learning about a little bit more about how people are learning from each other across UC health systems or outside of the UC system. Um, that was one question and sort of related was another one from Francisco Ramos uh, Gomez, which was asking about how pediatric dentists uh, potentially from UCLA and UCSF could, could collaborate and um, uh, work together to try and uh, address some of the um, uh, creating more a more sustainable healthcare setting. Um, yeah, actually, it was a really good question. I've been trying to work with our dentist school of dentistry on on some of those things. Um, one of the things that we identify was LED lights, exam lights. Um, the typical ones are made of halogen, which are very high energy demand, and they could switch over to LED lamps very easily. Um, plastics is a big issue in dentistry. Um, there was a study done by um, Nami Patel, who's she, her moniker is the green dentist, <laughs> and she runs a very green and clean dental office. Um, she shared a, 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 an image of all the waste generated from one dentist's office in one month, and it was a 10 by 10 foot cube, 10 by 10 by 10 foot cube of plastic, mostly plastic. So it's really significant. No, no one really uh, collects all that to see what that impact is. But not only are they using plastic, but they are actually purchasing products that are made of fossil fuel. So you know that whole plastic um, use of plastic is just driving the market for more fossil fuel extraction. Um, one of the things that we try to do is, um, you know, most times autoclave. Um, materials are are wrapped in plastic and thrown away every time. And there's a company called Enviro Pouch that actually makes a reusable autoclave bag that could be reused two, three hundred times. And it's it, it, so it's it's really eliminating a lot of plastic. Um, another thing is nitrous oxide. We like I mentioned before about nitrous oxide, and I can mention it again for hospitals. Almost every hospital uses a distribution system for their nitrous oxide um, you know, delivery to the patients. And um, invariably they leak. No one really notices it because people, the people who are buying it are not the same people who are using it. But when they look at the amount used versus the amount actually administered to patients, it's, it's really quite um, alarming. So we, we just, when we, when we found out that um, the numbers of, of purchase was actually going up, but the amount of administration was about stay about the same. Then we realized that there was really a problem. So that's definitely something in dentistry. I don't know if it, they have it um, just put it through a distribution system or if it's just from the cylinder. But that's what we're doing is we're going to be using cylinders. And then one more thing I just want to mention: uh, BPA is in in teeth sealants. <laughs> So you're actually putting BPA in, in a patient's mouth and it, it will leach over time um, from that patient. So those are areas that we've been looking at. Um, definitely can be something that we can work with dental schools to really promote more. Just general awareness would be good. So I'd be happy to, to work with that group to do that. Awesome. Um, 
I had I I had one question and um to to ask to Karina if you um if you don't mind reflecting a little bit on the um the tension that seems to be that much of our conversation in, in healthcare around climate change is a little bit more focused on adaptation. Um, so to your sort of discussion about counseling families and sort of thinking about the the effects of climate change, that we would our role is to help people as they deal with the effects of climate change, heat, wildfires, allergies, that kind of asthma, that kind of thing. Um, but I also feel like there's a role for us as pediatricians to sort of do the upstream work and that, that advocacy. And maybe that's why in our poll, there are more people sort of talking about doing that adv advocacy. But how do you how do you sort of balance that as you think about like the American Board of Pediatric um, modules that, that you work on? Like, how do you think about that, those messages and how to balance the adaptation versus the advocate for less greenhouse gas and, you know, fight the fossil fuel um, company kind of thing? Yeah, I think um, that's a good question. I mean, a, a lot of what we talk about is about adaptation. Um, and that is also important in terms of heat and air pollution exposure, both inside and outside. And um, and a part of that MOC part four module on how to communicate goes into keeping it not political and not partisan because that's the danger and the fear that I think a lot of people have is that they're going to get into some sort of argument about politics or something with a patient. So keeping it focused on the child's health um, is the best thing and <laughs> not getting into that. So diet is one way we can approach that. And Lisa showed um, Reshma Shah's book and that uh, changing our diet has a big impact on um, our carbon footprint. And I think, Gail, when you mentioned um, where we get our food, Reshma Shah show, has a slide that shows us some studies that where we get our food isn't as important as what we eat. So uh, eating a, a lot of livestock and meat has a much bigger um see carbon footprint effect than whether we get it locally or not. I don't know if that's that's part of her uh, thing. So speaking about what's healthier for children anyway is to eat more plant-based foods and healthy natural foods versus processed foods and a ton of meat um, is a is a good way to go getting um, good exercise but of course and being outside because you know we can talk about the Air, air pollution inside. Um, but I think, you know, going farther upstream, you have to choose your patients probably and, and know your family um, before you get into too much of that, I would think. Mm -hmm. I mean, voting is going up way upstream. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that you don't even need to say what, you're not telling anybody what to vote for. And um, just to keep in mind uh, that they can have an impact on their health by the, the people that they vote for and the policies that they're uh, voting on. So that's way upstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have other thoughts that you uh, might use in your practice? Um, well, I think there is there are two things actually that we were sort of talking about in our in our committee the other day. One of which is um, for kids who have eco anxiety, having them get involved in advocacy. That would be like to me when you're saying like choose your patients. That was to me one thing that I think can be very helpful. And to to Lisa, your point about being with groups, um, you know, find your people. That that can be really helpful for for our patients who are suffering from eco anxiety and sort of mental health and depression um, around climate. Um, so that was one thought that came up and then, um, uh, and there's another one and I just forgot what it was, but of sudden, yeah, that, that's I mean, a super remember. good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, using active transportation, which is healthier anyway than, you know, driving everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I live in Los Angeles and everybody drives everywhere, but part of the reason is that it's not safe. So, uh, you know, t 
kids advocating for more bike lanes and sidewalks that you can actually walk on. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Amanda and Karina, you guys both had some questions around um, anesthetic gases. Do you want to circle back to this? And I'll, I can read them to you if you want. Actually, the, I can, the other question I had to Gail is I'm curious, like, I mean, because UCSF is doing so, so much. And if you have a sense of like where sort of the initial excitement has been, like what, what has been sort of low hanging fruit or where it's been easy to get a lot of people fired up and what, what has been harder, if you have a sense of that. Uh, wow. I think, you know, when COVID hit and everything became disposable, people looked around and they just solve so much waste everywhere. And I think that's where um, a lot of the clinical staff got engaged. Mm. Um, and then, um, you know, when we looked at what, what other things we could do, the anesthesia gases was a, a big area that, um, that we thought we could have a big impact. But um, frankly, I, I think the, what you put in the chat, Amanda, is, is the key. If we can get the Joint Commission to get hospitals to be responsible for their operations and the amount of emissions they put into the atmosphere, that is a huge um, shift in healthcare. Because, you know, I started this, I started working in healthcare in 2000. And uh, even then, the hospitals would say, you know, that's, we're here to take care of patients. We're not here to save the world. <laughs> and, um, it just wasn't on their radar. And I've been working all this time to try and get it on the radar. And even when you look at Practice Green Health and their membership, a lot of hospitals aren't even members. So I think the Joint Commission could really make a huge impact. And so I, you know, I encourage you all to take a look at the link that Amanda put on and, um, and send your comments in that everything that they, they mentioned and suggested um, are really important. And not only that, but it's it shows healthcare as leaders and and be providing examples for other industries that the, you know if healthcare and hospitals can do it, they can certainly do it. Um, one thing that's interesting in that Joint Commission survey, they talked about inhalers as a as a good source of um, HFC you know propellants. And we did a big study to try to transition to um, propellant inhalers to powder. So that maybe that's something that um, you know could be considered to shift over to if there's a possibility in your formularies. Awesome. Um, Lisa, can I ask you a question also? Yeah, sure. Um, for uh, um, for that, that partnering with schools, the K-12 stuff, mm -hmm. um, do you want to give recommendations? Like I, that's something that we, like, as we've been brainstorming, like, what is the role of the pediatrician? How can we, how can we play a role? That's a very specific relationship that, um, that we haven't explored that much. If you had recommendations for like how, what next steps would you suggest doing to help work with your, work with your schools to help take advantage of that IRA, all those IRA incentives, like that's an amazing opportunity. Yeah, um, and it's it's just going to be so different depending on which district um, you're in, because there are some that have already passed climate resolutions. Uh, there are some where um, the word climate change is treated like a dirty word, <laughs> and so it's really going to vary from place to place. Um, and and the the other thing, and, and I'll just say, you know, five or six years ago, before I really got involved in climate activism, I remember just sitting on my couch and just being like, that I don't like, this is a big problem. I don't even know where to start. I don't know where to begin. And now like I'm, I'm in it. I, there's like lots of work to do, but, but if you haven't begun yet, um, you just have to st like join meetings, find, find an issue you're really passionate about. Um, as you've seen from this call, there are so many places where you can get involved. Um, it's really just finding about finding that thing that you're passionate about and climate change encompasses everything. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's food or energy or waste, um, whatever it is, like find that issue that really drives you and then start working on it. And to this issue of, of how to get involved in schools, um, if, if you're not deep in this in terms of the technical knowledge, 
the place to really begin is to start joining these coalition calls. Um, start immersing yourself in, in what's going on and start talking to other people that work in the space and then the opportunities will present themselves. Don't expect, um, you know, these, these issues are deep and complicated. So don't expect on like the first or the second or even the fifth meeting that suddenly you're going to have something to do. Um, mm -hmm. It just takes a little bit of time and patience. And if you're willing to invest that time, believe me, the work will come. <laughs> so you, you just you just have to you just have to keep showing up. Uh, basically, and and even if you haven't figured it out in the beginning, you will get there because there's so much to do, and we do not have enough hands on deck to handle it all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. And that reminded me actually of the other um, patient situation I was thinking of, which that we had talked about, which is um, talking to patients about how to take advantage of the IRA incentives. Actually, was the uh, that's the other very specific um, conversation to have with with patients. Uh, because it addresses both the equity issues, because um, it can help a family financially yeah. uh, if they take advantage of them. So, And we are actually at the consortium, we just got funding, we just got a grant to actually create those patient-facing materials. Mm -hmm. So we are working on that in the next, um, hopefully in the six, next six months, we'll have, um, we're, we're developing these in concert with the uh, National Association of Community Health Clinics for FQHCs and community clinics, but obviously this will have broader application across other clinics um, should they want to, to use them. So, mm -hmm. um, but for now, if you want a good resource to be um, using for your patients, Rewiring America has some really good uh, materials that basically says like, you have $14,000 $14, from the federal government waiting for up to $14,000 waiting for you in tax credits um, to, to use towards your home. Um, and, you know, here's how you can use them. Yeah. No, amazing. Thank you. Um, and uh, Yolanda is just reminding me that we are almost at time. Um, we have one last thing to do, which is um, to our closing, our, our sort of closing activity, very brief. Um, Sonia, you want to, you want to take that away? Sure. Um, so I sort of alluded to this earlier, but, um, and I think this has been such a great Q and A um, because it's talked about so many different specific actions. But this, the last activity we want to spend um, for the last few minutes is just a note to your future climate self. You can use the Google form that um, we've created here and um, fill it out. It's the idea is to set a commitment um, that in six months from now, what would you like to accomplish? What step would you like to take? If you provide your email in the form, we will also send this to you in six months as a way of holding ourselves accountable. Um, so we'd love for people to take a moment to fill this out. And if you would like to share what you'd like to do as a way of holding yourself accountable within the community, you're welcome to do that too, to share in the chat. I think the hope is, uh, is anybody, if anybody wants to throw more into the chat, but I think absolutely we can say goodbye and thank you to everybody. Really amazing. And thank you to our speakers and to Yolanda and Sana, who's not here. Um, for thank all you to chapter one for organizing this. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all so much. I know it's a lot yeah. of work to piece together. So thank you. Much appreciated. Bye. Yeah, have a good evening. Have a good night, everyone. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you.